Turn to the book of James, if you would. The book of James, chapter 4. James, chapter 4. We'll begin reading in verse 13. I want to talk to you about a subject that James brings up. Doing God's will. Doing God's will. James chapter 4. Now remember one of the themes of the book of James, one of the earliest of the epistles, is the immaturity of the believer. Now don't mistake that, <clears throat> well, he's speaking to new converts. No, that's not what he's speaking to. Maturity doesn't depend on how long you've been saved. So he, we, I say we, that sometimes, I include myself, sometimes we act immature. We've already seen that in chapter 1, chapter 2, uh, chapter 3 with our tongue. And now he's talking to us in chapter 4 about our enemies and how we act immature sometimes dealing with our enemies. But also the immature believer struggles, struggles with the will of God. And why? And James is going to confront that to these believers that were struggling with the will of God. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I do. What is God's will and how can I know it? And why is it important? And is it important? So James deals with that subject in these few verses. Because we all sometimes act immature. So in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, he says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell, and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For y'all to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Doing God's will. Why don't we do God's will sometimes? David Livingston said this, I'd rather be in the heart of Africa, in the will of God, than the throne of England, out of the will of God. Someone asked a teen one time um, about doing the will of God. And they said, well, I would give my life to the Lord, but I'm afraid. And they said, you're afraid of what? I'm afraid God will ask me to do something dangerous. Warren Wiersbe said this, The safest place in the world is right where God wants you. Isn't that wonderful? To be right where God wants you. It was Stonewall Jackson that made this statement. When he seemed like he was fearless in battle. He said, I'm just as safe in bed as I am in the battlefield when I know I'm in the will of God. To realize that we can follow His will and God has a plan and purpose for our lives. And why don't we do His will? Maybe it's because we're afraid of what God will ask us to do. Maybe we've been convinced that the will of God is, is not exciting or, or fun, or if I do God's will, I'll never have any fun in my life. But God knows better than we do. Some would think that, well, God only wants me to do the major things, the little things God uh, doesn't care about. But we know that according to James, he tells us about those who deny His will, those who do His will and those who disobey His will. But as we look at this morning, denying God's will, we reasons it is foolish to deny God's will. And He tells us, first of all, as we see in verse 13, 
I called it the complexity of life. Life is filled with decisions. Every day. And, and James deals with that. He says that uh, there's buying and selling and getting gain and what are we going to do and what we're going to do and what we're going to buy and what we're not going to buy and going here and going there. That life is filled with decisions every day. What am I going to wear today? What am I going to do today? What is on my priority list today? Life is filled with decisions. We, we could probably in this auditorium come up with a, a hundreds of decisions that each of us have made every single day. And, and how are we to know God's will? And James says the reason we need to do God's will is because of the complexity of life. The complexity of life. If I were to ask you today, how many have ever been to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee? Let me see your hand. Okay, two, four, six, eight, nine, ten. Okay, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, count myself. F maybe fifteen people or so. So I would assume the rest of you have never been. So, you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, that's okay. But I could say to you, well, I've been to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And I can tell you about a, a nice place to eat. I can tell you about some places to go. I can tell you about some places not to go. Why? Because I have been there. And I know. I know where the tourist traps are. I know where the good places are. And I know maybe some good places to stay. And maybe you do too, because you have been there. And isn't it a blessing to know that we serve one who has already been there? Been there where? Tomorrow. And when you get up every day, you can face the day with somebody who's already been there. And somebody as a shepherd that tells us every day that I'll be your shepherd and come and follow me and my steps. When you deny God's will for your life, you become the decision maker of life's complex problems and decisions. But isn't it a blessing to know that we can trust one who is all-knowing? And what a beautiful song that Brother Dave sang, the Ancient of Days. He's been in the past, he's been in the present, and he's been in the future. He always is and always will be. And he can say to his children, come follow me into your tomorrow, into your today, because I'll help you make decisions on a regular basis. Isn't that beautiful? Doing God's will is a wonderful choice because life is filled with complexity and decisions of going and buying and selling. Reasons it's foolish to deny God's will is because of the uncertainty of life. The uncertainty of life. James would tell us, he said, you know not what shall be on tomorrow. Is there anyone here today that can guarantee that you'll even be here tomorrow? The uncertainty of life. Oh, to realize the Bible says in Proverbs 21, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Jesus told us about a man who ignored his tomorrows, who ignored his life. He said, The ground of a certain rich man that brought forth plentiful, when he thought within himself, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? He said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. In other words, he's busy going and coming and living his life. 
But I say unto you, my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he is that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Oh, to realize, I thought about that song that we often sing, I don't know about tomorrow. To realize that we may not know about tomorrow. We might, might not know what tomorrow brings. It says, I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its clouds may turn to gray. I don't worry or the future, for I know what Jesus said. What a blessing to know that life is uncertain. But we can rest assured that we have one who has promised to be with us every step of the way. And notice the brevity of life, how James describes our life. It is even a, va a vapor that appeareth for a little time. In other words, it, it, it's here just for a little bit. What is 70, 80, 90 even a hundred years uh, compared to eternity. It's like a vapor. I don't know about you, but it seems like the older I get, the faster time moves, doesn't it? It seems like when you were a child, the days were so long, but the older you get, the faster time seems to fly by. And I believe David had that in mind when he said in Psalm 90 and verse 12, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Job saw this when he said in Job chapter 7 and verse 9, As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. Then he says in chapter 8 and verse 9, But we are but of yesterday and know nothing, because our days upon the earth are a shadow. They're here, and they're gone. He's speaking not only the uncertainty of life, but the brevity of life, that how it can be here and like a vapor uh, that disappears just within a moment of time. Oh, as you know, in recent days, we had you praying for the family, the Glass family. And when we were with Dr. Anderson this past week and he preached the funeral of Hannah Glass, a 19-year-old college student, her first semester in college. She had took a lot of, taken a lot of online classes. And when this was her first semester and she ate a brownie and a few hours later, she never regained consciousness. 19 years of age. I remember years ago, I had a cousin that I played with quite a, a bit. His name was Wesley. And Wesley and I played together as kids. We were about the same age. And we didn't live very far there on West Cloud Springs Road in, in Rossville, Georgia. I went one direction into the ministry and Wesley went into the army. And it wasn't very long afterwards that I was preparing for the ministry at, at Tennessee Temple that I heard that Wesley, my cousin, had died. He was on guard duty. And something happened. I don't know whether they never really found out what happened, but he fell and hit his head of all things and never regained consciousness. It really spoke to me as a young man because I had the inclination that, you know, we, we just live and live and I'm going to live to be who knows how old, but when I saw here is this, my cousin, my same age in the army that, that went to be with the Lord. So the will of God, reasons that it's foolish to deny God's will, 
But again, isn't it a blessing to know that we have an ancient of days who guides us? In Tennessee, I can tell you about a place to go. It's called the Mammoth Caves. It's the world's largest underground caves. The tours that go through the caves in Kentucky, they say stretch some 350 miles. You can go on these tours that some will just be for a few minutes as the one that we went on. Some can go on for a few hours and some can go on for days. The guide will come to an area where they will turn the lights off and they will turn them on at a little rock called Pulpit Rock. Pulpit Rock. And, and the rock's kind of in the shape of a pulpit. That's why they call it Pulpit Rock. And the guide will give a five-word sermon. And I wrote it down. A five-word five sermon. And here's what it says. Stay close to your guide. Stay close to your guide. Isn't that beautiful? We have a life to live. And sometimes it's dark. We don't know which way to go and which direction. But we can stay close to our God. Some don't want to do the will of God. But the Bible tells us doing His will in verse 15. James gives us the purpose in our lives. Why are we here? Now, evolution and humanists tell us that we're here by random chance. We're here by no purpose at all. But we know to the believer that we're made in the image of God and we're made in His likeness. And God has a plan and a will for each of His children. So James tells us the purpose in our life that we ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Again, listen to the book of Acts as Luke gives us a direction for the life of the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 14, you remember the story of Ananias who was a devout man and he was given a contact with the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he said. And he said, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour, I looked up and behold him. Now, now Paul, of course, is speaking. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. In other words, God is saying to Paul, uh, God wants you to know his will and do it. And God wants you to know His will and do it. In fact, in John chapter 7 and verse 17, Jesus said, If any man will do His will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, and whether I speak of myself. In other words, Jesus said, I came to do the will of the Father. In fact, He prayed in the garden not once, not twice, but three times. Father, not my will, but thine be done. And I like how Hebrews looks back and describes it. In Hebrews chapter 12, listen to what he says in verse 2. Looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. Now what joy is he talking about? Doing the will of God. For his life. Well, what was God's will for his life? It says, The joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Isn't that beautiful? He did the will of God here on earth, and now he's doing the will of God at the right hand of the Father. Listen to how Paul prayed for the church of Colossae. 
to, for those believers. Listen to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. Listen to this prayer. You, you, uh, would we all pray this way? For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? You can pray for your loved ones, your spouse, your children. Pray for me that way. Pray for all of us that we might what? Be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You see, God wants us to know His will. He wanted His Son to know His will. He wanted Paul to know His will. Paul wanted the early Colossians to know His will. In Ephesians chapter 5, uh, the Paul says in verse 17, right before he talks about being filled with the Spirit, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. He wants us to prove His will in our lives. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. He says, Be not conformed to this world. Do you think that's God's will? But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, Paul tells the church in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 6, he said, Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. From the heart. Now, a few uh, months ago, we did a study with uh, Jim Berg on essential <laughs> virtues, which is a study, in essence, of Second Peter chapter 1. And I loved his lesson when he dealt with, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, when he dealt with, listen to what he says, and give all diligence, get, uh, and beside this, giving all diligence, that you add to your faith virtue. Now when we read that virtue, most of the time, well, what does that mean? I, I, I love his definition. Here's what he says. The word virtue is the word arete. You remember that class? Sunday school class? You remember that? Arete? It's, it's translated here, uh, virtue. It means excellence. It was used to denote the proper fulfillment of anything. He goes on to say, the excellence, arete, of a knife is to what? Is to cut. A horse is to run. Something was excellent or virtuous only if it fulfilled its purpose. Now, if you got a knife that doesn't cut, it's not going to be a good knife. If you got a horse that doesn't run, it's not going to be a good horse. If you got a boat that doesn't float, then it's not going to be a good boat. But again, listen to what he says. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. He uses the same word. He said that you should show forth the praises. The word praises there is arete. Of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, he goes on to say this. Cultivating a God-mandated purpose to develop and display the excellencies of of Jesus Christ. Now I'm not going to teach that whole lesson again. But, but what is it? Fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Isn't that beautiful? I know that God's purpose is for me to be right here behind this pulpit preaching the Word of God in this place fulfilling God's will for my life and for this ministry. Are you in the center of God's will fulfilling the purpose in your life that God and Jesus Christ might be glorified on a daily basis? What a beautiful thought. Someone said the secret of a happy life is to delight in duty. When duty becomes delight, then burdens become blessings. David said, Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. 
Again, someone else said, when we love God, then His statutes become songs and we enjoy serving Him. When we serve God grudgingly, or because we have to, we may accomplish His work, but we ourselves will miss the blessing. It will be toil and not ministry. But when we do God's will from the heart, we are enriched no matter how difficult the task might have been. Warren Wiersbe said that. That's why J Hebrews could say, for the joy that was set before him. Sometimes God's purpose for our life is hard things. Sometimes it may be enduring the cross, despising the shame. But for the joy that was set before him, doing God's will from the heart. You see, that's the problem. I believe that many a Christian is, is there's not a problem with knowing the will of God. I think the problem with many a Christian is, is doing the will of God. If you have a heart for God, He'll show you His will. You'll understand His will. I love what Mr. Economitis, my old Sunday school teacher, used to say. The will of God is the natural outflow of the surrendered life. And that's the problem with many a Christian. The natural outflow of the surrendered life. Could I share with you just quickly, is one man that I studied much of my ministry was George Mueller. And if you know anything about George Mueller and the life that he lived and the great work that he did and the orphan homes that he built, and he never asked for anything except from God. Now again, that's not everybody's way to live. I know Dr. Robertson said, hey, you got a burden, you got a need, let it be known. There might be somebody out there that would meet it. So, uh, but that was God's will and what George Mueller felt like God wanted him to do. But let me give you quickly uh, some of his principles by which he lived his life. And the first one is simply, I, very, I believe very basic to the Christian life, he didn't say it this way, but I believe what he meant was dying to self. You want to know God's will? Get self out of the way. Here's what George Mueller said, I quote, I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. Now remember, the immature believer struggles with that. Why? Because he lives a selfish life. He wants to live and do as he pleases. So that, that becomes a problem. But oh, what a joy to know when we come to that place in our lives where we say, Lord, whatever your will is, I'll be most delighted to do it. If you want me to have it or not have it. If you want me to go there or not go where, there. What did James say? If the Lord's will, we will do this or that. Number two, the Word of God. God leads us according to His Word. God will not lead you to do something that's contrary to this book. And I often through the years of ministry as a pastor, the people have come to me saying, well, God's leading me to do this, and God's leading me to do that. And you think, uh -uh, He's not. It's contrary to this book. There's obvious commands that God gives us in His Word. And we could, we could spend a whole message here about lying and cheating and stealing and coveting. And there are certain things that God will lead us uh, as we seek His will. What is God's will and what does God's Word say about my family? What does His Word say about my finances? What does His Word say about my life? Find out what His Word says and then do it. It's not God's will you be on the lake this Sunday morning. It's God's will you be right here in church. Because the Bible says not to forsaking the assembling ourselves together as the manner of some is. It's not God's will that you be conformed to the world. What did he say? Be not conformed to the world. So find out what his word says and say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to obey his word. Number three, the Holy Spirit. We are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. What is the very next verse that Paul says uh, after he says understanding what the will of the Lord is? He says, well, be not drunk with wine when it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That's God's will for your life. 
is that I ask the Holy Spirit to control my tongue and my life on a daily basis. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, Paul said they are the sons of God. So how important it is. And we see that in the book of Acts, that they follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. So uh, again, the Bible said, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereinto I have called them. Again, doing His will. Again, we, we find that mentioned all the way uh, through the book of Acts that God would lead them. But again, let me say, be careful of impressions. The Bible says to try the spirits. Number four is prayer. The saturate your life with prayer, George Mueller said. And your prayer, keep in mind, is not to get God to do what you want. Prayer is to get you to get in tune with what God's will is for your life. I like John 15 and 7 where Jesus said, If you abide in me. Oh, isn't that beautiful? That's the Christian life. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will. What did John the Baptist say? He said, Let him increase and let me decrease. Oh, what did we say? What did James tell us? Draw nigh to God. And the closer we get to God, He'll draw nigh to us. And, and what did we say last week? That nearness is likeness. Oh, and we can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then quickly, not only as we pray and seek God's will and follow His leadership. Oh, let me give quickly another verse. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, 5 and verse 14 when he says, And this is confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, he heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. What a beautiful way to live. Lord, You know better than I do. Aren't you glad that sometimes God didn't give you what you wanted? I'm glad. Because sometimes like a selfish or like a spoiled child, I wanted what I wanted and I wanted it, and God didn't give it to me. I look back now and say, Ooh, thank you, Jesus. You didn't give me what I wanted. Lord, help me to trust your decision-making in my life. And then number five, he said, providential circumstances. Take into account, George Mueller said, the providential circumstances in your life. To him who knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. God will work in your way and in such a wonderful way that you will see and know it is the will of God. You know, when I drive that van out visiting and the ladies took it yesterday, what a blessing, what a blessing. And I realize, and, and you need to understand, we looked 250 miles radius, maybe further than that, wasn't it, Brother Dave? And you know what? That was the only van that fit our criteria. Isn't that God? Isn't God? He led us right to the very exact one that He wanted us to have. You can see the hand of God. We often call it a God thing. Well, you just can't deny that God was in it. You don't have to convince people. But you see the hand of God in a providential way, in a wonderful way. And then let me add a, a sixth one that's mine, not necessarily His, but seeking godly counsel and wisdom. Godly counsel. Solomon said, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You see, godly people often agree upon the same thing. As they seek godly counsel, you don't have to be afraid uh, of uh, uh, seeking counsel uh, about a matter. And oftentimes, we like Rehoboam, we go to people who want to tell us what we want to hear. To our peers. But how important the Bible says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. And then another one uh, George Mueller did uh, imply was an ensuing peace. A peaceful spirit about a decision. Now again, you must be careful that that is maybe one of the last things you do. People often come to me and say, I just got a peace about this. Well, uh, did, you, did you try the spirits? Did you line it by the Word of God? Did you pray about it? Or you just got some feeling? Peace is not relief. 
that we've done what we wanted to do. But there's a settled peace that comes from the Lord. God sometimes sends us an uneasy spirit about this decision or this direction. Does God want us to know His will? Sure He does. He's given us a guidebook. He's given us His Holy Spirit. He's given us godly counsels and godly friends and a godly pastor. He's given us a, His a Holy Spirit that lives within us, that knows the mind of the Father, and even prays for us sometimes when we don't know, Lord, what will I do? James says, if any man lack wisdom, ask. Ask. Again, I'm convinced that many a Christian it's not that they don't know what the will of God is. They just don't want to do it. Disobeying God's will. Let's look in, in verse 17. Disobeying God's will. What does he say? Therefore to him that knoweth to do good. Is obeying this word good? Is listening to the Holy Spirit's direction good? Is, is seeking godly counsel good? Is knowing to do the right thing and not doing it, is it sin? Yes. How often we live our lives by our feelings. Why do people choose to disobey God's will? Let me give you just a couple, and maybe you might have some of your own. I believe it's pride. It's pride. He said all such rejoicing is evil. We think we know better than God. We think our way is better than God's way. And we just want to do what we want to do. Sometimes we're deceived. People have the mistaken idea that the will of God is a formula for misery. Young people, you couldn't be in a better place. Say, God, what do you want for my life? God's not up there to make your life miserable. He wants you to know the joy of the Lord your whole life. The walk in His will, and in His way. People are deceived by the devil and by themselves to say, well, if I do God's will, then I'll have a miserable life. But oh, God has the best intentions uh, for His children as we seek to do His will. Again, why do some people deny His will? It's sad because life is complex. Every day there's decisions and places to go, people to see, people to talk to. How dare I wake up a day and decide to live it in my own wisdom and guidance. Life is uncertain. Live every day like it's your last day. You never know, like Hannah Glass at 19 years old, that got up and that was her last conscious day. The brevity of life. The first thing you need to do is to be saved. If you don't know Jesus Christ, the Bible says it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. The first step is being saved and know that you're saved. And say, Lord, what is your will? Well, I need to be baptized. I need to join the church. I need to obey God's word and go to church. I need to read my Bible. I need to witness. I need the tithe. What does His word say about my family and my friends and my finances? And, and find His will in the word. And then we have His Holy Spirit. What a blessed thought. But what the immature believer, we get to thinking that way sometimes. And what do we think? I can live my own life. Make my own decisions. Do what I want to do. But James says, oh no, oh no, you've lost track. Life is too short. Life is too short. The wasted on the flesh, the wasted on the world to do God's will. What a challenge. Would you bow with me in prayer? I believe it's God's will for our church to fulfill the Great Commission. Are you fulfilling God's will for your life in this church, in this ministry, on a daily basis? How important it is that James says, He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. You ought to say the Lord will. And how often times when we struggle with our will and God's will and things don't work out. James says you can't trust a better person than the Ancient of Days. He's already been to your tomorrow. Follow the shepherd. Lord, 
thank you for the wonderful promise that we have of a Savior that would give his life and die for us. And then he would want us to turn our lives over to him and follow his will. The Son did it, and he wants us to do it. God in the flesh, doing the will of the Father. And God has given us His Holy Spirit to live within us, that we too would do the will of the Father. Help us on a daily basis, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.